Hi guys, Dr. Whitney Costers here. Join me today for an in-depth discussion of Raymond Carver's short story, Cathedral. I want to start this lecture by actually quoting a couple of things in Carver's obituary because I think that they so accurately and perfectly capture the essence of who Carver was as a person. It is said in his obituary that Carver came from the hard scrabble world of the down and out blue collar characters in his stories. In fact, Carver declared once, I'm a paid in full member of the working poor. I have a great deal of sympathy with them. They're my people. The obituary further says that Carver had been everything from a janitor, a farm worker, a delivery boy, and in his spare time, he wrote. So Carver did indeed grow up in the working class. His mom was a waitress, his father was a sawmill worker, and unfortunately also an alcoholic. Carver himself would become an alcoholic and a heavy smoker. He would eventually um, die from lung cancer at the very young age of 50. He endured a pretty turbulent first marriage, but ultimately quit drinking and married the poet Tess Gallagher, with whom he had a much stronger and healthier relationship. Now I offer you some of this biographical context because it's so integral to, his, um, to understanding Carver's writing style and genre. His writing was primarily inspired by real life. And if you're familiar with Carver's repertoire, you'll know that he writes from the perspective of the working class, lower class figure. He's known for his minimalism or what is called dirty realism. These are stories of the lower class that emphasize the struggles and deprivation that people endure simply by being part of this class. Carver was certainly the master of dirty realism. This was a term that was coined by Bill Buford, who was a literary magazine editor. And Buford said that dirty realism is the fiction of a new generation of American authors. They write about the belly side of contemporary life, a deserted husband, an unwed mother, a car thief, a pickpocket, a drug addict. But they write about it with a disturbing detachment, at times verging on comedy. Understated, ironic, sometimes savage, but insistently compassionate, these stories constitute a new voice in fiction. Characters in dirty realism thus don't wallow in their degradation, or in Cathedral's case, the narrator doesn't wallow in self-pity, jealousy, or loneliness. His tone, detachment, and sparseness with words basically does that for him. In other words, Carver found a way to give artistic expression to the very things we often disassociate with artistic expression, things like degradation, poverty, struggles. And he does it without giving us loads of information. Ch um, Carver subscribed to one of his favorite writers, um, Chekhov. Chekhov's notion was that in short stories, it's better to say not enough than to say too much because, because I don't know why. Now, I just find this to be so funny because, of course, Chekhov knows why. He's Chekhov. He's got plenty of theoretical, literary, artistic, and aesthetic reasons for why he advocates for minimalism. But he's going to practice what he preaches and be reticent about it. So you'll find that Carver shows more than he tells, and the character's minimal means often informs their behavior and lifestyles. And minimal means does not necessarily only refer to that which they possess or own. It can equally refer to a character's shortcomings, problematic behavior, or limited ways of thinking. Now, if you're interested in the genesis of this minimalist style in Carver's first publications, I'll link a great article below which talks about the great and sometimes dubious influence and control that editor Gordon Lish had on Carver's earlier works. It ultimately came out after Carver's death that Lish took editing to the extreme with Carver's work, cutting up to 50% of his manuscripts sometimes. It's important to note that Carver often tried to include emotion, sentimentality, introspection, and description in his stories only to have some or all of it cut by Lish. This is why I'm so glad we're discussing Cathedral today, because it's perhaps a better representation of Carver as a writer, though I should mention that his second wife does claim that she had a great deal of influence in the making of Cathedral, so that's something to keep in mind. But ultimately, in Cathedral, Carver was not controlled by Lish and his choices. By the time Carver wrote Cathedral, he was a much more established writer and had more autonomy over his work. 
He even told Lish at this time that if he wanted to edit his next collection, he would have to keep his hands off, saying, I can't undergo that kind of surgical amputation and transplantation. I think this is a very telling statement for what sort of influence was held over his earlier work. Carver stated that Cathedral was totally different in conception and execution from his previous work. And he said, when I wrote Cathedral, I experienced this rush and I felt this is what it's all about. This is the reason we do this. It was different than the stories that had come before. There was an opening up when I wrote the story. I knew I'd gone as far the other way as I could or wanted to go, cutting down to the bone. Any farther in that direction and I'd be at a dead end, writing stuff and publishing stuff I wouldn't want to read myself, and that's the truth. Now, as generous as Cathedral is, it's still quite minimal in style. In fact, think about who tells us this story. It's Bub, as we know him, this first person narrator. And this guy is anything but insightful, emotional, explicit, or generous with words. Carver has given us a narrator who not only will not tell us the meaning of this story, but who can't tell us. Remember the discomfort and predicament and in inability he feels just when he's asked to describe a cathedral, which is a building that is literally before him on the TV. He can't quite adequately describe what it is. Now he can offer these general facts, like they're very tall, they're supported by buttresses, they're built of stone, but this could really be any building. It doesn't distinguish a cathedral from much else. He can't express their awesomeness, grandeur, beauty, the feeling of reverence, sacredness, holiness, humility, gratitude that they are intended to inspire in their patrons. And he knows he's no good at this. For one thing, I don't think he can articulate any of this because he's totally incapable of feeling such profound emotions. So we have to take what Bub shows us and discern the meaning from the pieces he gives us. Kind of like when the wife tells Bub about Robert's marriage to Beulah. Bub, who is clearly only half listening, says, Right then, my wife filled me in with more detail than I cared to know. I made a drink and sat at the kitchen table to listen. Pieces of the story began to fall in place. We must psychoanalyze Bub based on his behavior. I mean, we are even precluded from hearing what others say about him. The wife talks about him in her tapes to Robert, and at one point, Robert, who is a pretty insightful guy, starts to offer a character assessment of Bub when he says, from all you've said about him, I can only conclude, but then the conversation is interrupted by a knock at the door, and so we never receive the most integral information. Not only are we not privy to some insight into Bub, but so is Bub, who is trying to listen to the recording. And he acknowledges this because he says, eh, maybe it was just as well. I'd heard all I wanted to. This is really important, I think. He's certainly not introspective because he puts up this wall of cynicism, sarcasm, ridicule, prejudice, disdain, anything that prevents him from reflection. Anything he doesn't know or understand, he pokes fun at or rolls his eyes at. So who is Bub? He's definitely closed off. And he's judgmental about Robert, not just because Bub's a jerk, but also because he has no real experience with people or any real connection with them. He thinks blind people are sad and depressing. In fact, he says about Robert, his being blind bothered me. Now, I don't think Bub is specifically prejudiced against the disability. I think he's so ignorant of people in general that he allows his only idea of blind people, which remember he gets from TV, to inform his understanding of who blind people are as though they're all the same person. On TV, according to Bub, blind people move slow, never laugh, don't smoke. So it's not hard to see why Bub isn't excited about Robert coming, um, especially if this is his impression of blind people. I have to assume that much of what Bub knows about people and relationships comes from TV. I mean, his wife reminds him that he has no friends, and we know that he and his wife rarely go to bed together. He usually opts to stay up late, um, watch TV, and smoke weed. We know, too, that he's pretty unsupportive of her. He's irritated that he has to host her friend for the night. I mean, honestly, it's pretty surprising that he's even married, and especially to the type of woman that his wife is. She is clearly open-minded, um, social, communicative, and sensitive to feelings. 
she and Robert develop a close relationship, reading together and sending audio tapes to one another in which they discuss intimate details of their lives. We know that they connected when Robert felt her whole face to understand who she is in the same way that he later will with the drawing um, and the narrator. And we know that his wife was so impacted by this experience that she wrote a poem about it. And what genre you know, best expresses human emotion? It is poetry. So even when she was um, you know, at her lowest depth, she was lonely and isolated, she attempted suicide because she couldn't handle it. And yet these are things that I think the narrator actually thrives on. I think another reason the narrator speaks so unkindly about the blind man as he calls him is because this guy who literally can't see and who lives across the country and has all these ridiculous restrictions projected onto him by the narrator's very limited understanding of blind people has a greater connection and understanding with people. For instance, we know that he used to be a ham radio operator and when he meets Bub, he says, I feel like we've already met. He also, and most importantly, has a greater connection with Bub's wife than Bub ever has had and probably ever will. The narrator acknowledges this indirectly here and there, like when he says, I saw my wife laughing as she parked the car. I saw her get out of the car and shut the door. She was still wearing a smile, just amazing. You'll notice that we never see the wife laughing or smiling around Bub. In fact, the only emotions he really elicits in her in the story at least, are anger and, exa and exasperation. He also tells us, my wife finally took her eyes off the blind man and looked at me. I had the feeling she didn't like what she saw. I shrugged. So he brushes this off rather than fully internalizing their disconnection. In fact, Robert has had a much more fulfilling experiential life than the narrator ever has, despite the rather severe limitations that Bub imposes on him as a disabled man. And there's a reason for this. Robert doesn't allow his disability to prevent him from having a full life. He even tells Bub, whatever you want to watch is okay. I'm always learning something. Learning never ends. It won't hurt me to learn something tonight. I got ears. This willingness to learn stands in stark contrast to Bub, who does everything he can to remain isolated, limited, and ignorant. There's clearly some jealousy and resentment and feelings of inadequacy here. And I think that might be why Bub constantly refers to Robert as the blind man, even as he tells this story retrospectively, after he's had the experience of the drawing, the cathedral, everything. To the narrator, identifying Robert as the blind man immediately equates him to a disability that is restrictive, and it renders Robert less of a full person, less identifiable, meaningful, and therefore less threatening to the narrator. But it may just make Bub also feel less inadequate in the presence of someone who is clearly superior to him. This is likely why Bub even makes fun of Robert's marriage and his wife, but yet again, we see just how fulfilling Robert's life is compared to Bub's. The narrator tells us about Robert and Beulah. They'd married, lived, and worked together, slept together, had sex, sure, and then the blind man had to bury her. All this without his having ever seen what the goddamned woman looked like. It was beyond my understanding. Now you have to wonder if he means it's beyond his understanding how such a marriage could work, or if it means it's beyond his understanding to have such an intense, beautiful connection with your partner. The last thing he says about Robert and Beulah is that Robert had half of a 20 peso Mexican coin and the other half was buried with Beulah. And he calls this very sentimental and loving gesture pathetic. Bub is constantly minimizing anything that he can't understand. We can also discern Bub's irritation, jealousy, and feelings of inadequacy through tone. Bub is pretty minimal in his language and words. He comes off as clinical and repertorial. But in Carver, as it's said by other scholars, the less that is said, the more pointed the statement and the more menacing the tone. The two sections in Cathedral in which the narrator recalls the recordings paradoxically seem emotionless. For instance, she wanted to talk, they talked. He asked her to send him a tape and tell him about her life. She did this. She sent the tape. He sent her the tape. She made a tape. This went on for years. 
things are stated in such analytical, objective, detached sorts of ways. Yet the brevity and harshness of the description suggest an unwillingness to process or consider further the meaning of this relationship. It creates this undertone of annoyance, this feeling that the narrator is clearly bothered by the rather platonic, intimate relationship that exists between Robert and his wife, a relationship that develops more and more with every tape. This terse, objective way of speaking is even used when Bub describes his wife's history. He says, the man she was going to marry at the end of the summer was in officer's training school. He didn't have any money, but she was in love with the guy. Why should he have a name? And he was in love with her, etc. To him, the husband doesn't deserve an identity and her past is basically summed up by the word, etc. And when he speaks of her attempted suicide, it's like reading a very blunt clinical or police report. This detachment does not go unnoticed by his wife, who actually scolds him into having some sympathy for Robert, whose wife has just died. She says, God damn it, his wife just died. Don't you understand that? The man lost his wife. And no, I really don't think that he does understand it. You'll notice that the narrator consumes a lot of liquor in the story, and he tells us he smokes weed every night. You have to wonder if he's trying to find some way to feel, connect, be, or if he's just trying to drown out creeping feelings of anger, resentment, alienation, and disconnection. He clearly needs this altered experience. So the moment of the drawing is important. I mean, this is a connection he's never really had before. He admits that he's glad for Robert's company that evening as they're sitting by the TV. And when they start drawing, they're not just drawing together side by side, each of them crafting their own art. They're drawing it literally together with their hands on top of each other. We can only assume that the feelings Bub has in this moment are akin to what a religious person or, you know, even a non-religious person may feel when experiencing the grandeur, sublimity, and awesomeness of a cathedral. I mean, I don't think Carver just randomly had them draw a cathedral. Remember that Bub is not religious. In fact, he pokes fun at worship at dinner when he says, let's pray. And as Robert begins to bow his head, Bub finishes with, Pray the phone won't ring and the food doesn't get cold. And when describing the cathedral, Bub says, in those olden days when they built cathedrals, men wanted to be close to God. In those olden days, God was an important part of everyone's life. God is clearly not an important part of the narrator's life, but the point is that whatever he feels and experiences in this moment of human connection, it's a unique, profound, and singular experience like he's never had before. It's almost as though he's overcome by it, refusing to open his eyes and unable to answer his wife when she asks what they're doing. This moment, though, is complicated by the fact that the narrator's big experience happens when he's under the influence of alcohol and marijuana. So I'm curious if this changes the experience and the meaning of it for you as a reader. What I like so much about this story is that there's no moralizing here. Remember that the narrator is telling us this retrospectively. He's not going to expound on what sort of revelation this was, nor is he going to be self-admonishing for the way he judged and made assumptions about Robert and his disability. He doesn't offer any sort of guilt for or reevaluation of the way he so objectively spoke of his wife's traumatic experiences or the way he was prejudiced against blind people. For one thing, he just can't. He doesn't have the words to articulate what has happened, even if he knows something has happened. Consider his attempt to describe the cathedral to Robert, even if his life were on the line. He just can't do it. He's not going to go into detail for us in this story. He's a minimalist in words and thoughts. So the story is not didactic, but maybe it suggests that Bub is aware of how he once treated people. I'm not sure that this experience was revelatory and that it was life-changing and now he's on a different path, but it suggests that he's at least more aware of his shortcomings and how his behavior negatively impacted his life and others in the past. Now, I've told you already that Carver appreciated Chekhov. So much so that in his autobiographical sketch called On Writing, Carver emphasized his indebtedness to a line from a story by Chekhov that he reportedly liked so much that he pinned it on the wall beside his writing desk. And this line said, and suddenly everything became clear to him. Carver was intrigued, he said, by the hint of revelation that is implied. 
I think we can say for certain that that's what's going on here in Cathedral. And as Carver further explains in On Writing, short stories are glimpses of life and more importantly, illuminating glimpses. Carver just makes the reader figure out what the significance of those illuminating glimpses are for both the characters he writes and for us. So with that said, what is the meaning of the drawing for the narrator in your opinion? What does it do for him? Do you think that this is a positive ending? Has the narrator up and changed his life? Do you think he has a stronger, better marriage? Do you think he has better connections with people? Maybe he has friends now. Maybe he's friends with Robert. Or do you think this was just a beautiful, profound, but ephemeral moment for the narrator, but it was just that, and he has now reverted back to what he always was? One thing you need to keep in mind is that this is a man of very few words, and yet he is sharing with us pages and pages of words about this experience. So I want you to consider why he would do that and how that might suggest that he is somewhat a changed person. Let me know your thoughts and ideas below, and please check out my other videos discussing other canonical literary works. I really appreciate you guys joining me, and I hope to see you next time.